Welcome back. We're excited to have up next Paul Schultz, who's presenting Developing an IoT Sensor Network for Civic Applications. So Paul is an avid user of free and open software in a variety of industries and projects and has had a trifle patch accepted into the Linux kernel. Today's talk is about the STEM program at the public libraries in Port Adelaide Enfield, which started to build an IoT sensor network and the challenges faced by that project. Um, Paul is happy to take questions at the end of the presentation, so please post questions in Venulas. A reminder that we have the Venulas question tab, which is just alongside the chat tab there, and we'll be we'll get to those at the end. Over to you, Paul. Thank you very much. Um, while we're here, I might also get you to pop in where you're from. Um, uh, we might use that a bit later. Um, so what I'll be talking about is this uh, IoT sensor network that we're looking we're working at we're working on. Um, and so thanks to Port Adelaide Enfield. Um, Council, particularly STEM programs, um, they'll get a bit of a mention at the end um, because we were using this also as part of an outreach um, and community education program. Uh, so my background, um, I gave a talk in 2017 um, about an art installation that we did with um, some cosmic ray detectors that were distributed and we used a Wi-Fi network to get the data back. And this sort of extends, this project kind of extends on some of that work. Um, what other network can we use to collect sensor data? Um, and I ended up working with uh, Robert Hart, a similar, uh, who worked on that project um, with, with the libraries to see what we could do um, with regards to um, collecting um, data from the, the environment and what sort of applications we could use that for. So just a quick, um, rundown of where Port, the city of Port Adelaide Enfield is. Hopefully you can see that large area in the middle of the first map. Um, it's quite a large council um, with, with the usual residential and commercial to manufacturing and large open area empty spaces as well as the port area you see in the top left hand corner. So it's quite a diverse council area. Um, there's also uh, waste and um, waste handling services and other type of commercial uh, industrial um, areas in there as well. So this is quite a diverse place to try this stuff in. Um, firstly, some definitions. Um, I'll be talking about uh, LoRa radio. That's the actual little radio transceivers and you'll, we'll see some pictures of those in a sec um, that does the point to point communication. LoRaWAN is the uh, long-range WAN protocol that runs on top of the LoRa, ra LoRa radio stack. Uh, these things are picked up by LoRaWAN gateways, which are put out into the environment, which listen for these radio signals from your LoRaWAN devices or nodes, which, you, which are out there collecting the data for you. We made use of something called the Things Network, uh, which is a um, one particular service that runs on top of the LoRaWAN. So LoRaWAN itself can be um, implemented as a private network or as a uh, private service um, or as a public service as the Things Network does. The Things Industry is, the, is based on the Things Network technology um, and it provides more robust commercial type of applications. Um, so commercial type of infrastructure for, for businesses. Within the Things Network um, itself, they differentiate between applications, which are what you, um, how you collect your data, um, and devices which send data to the applications. So those two things, you and me, um, are within the the Things Net are defined within the Things Network, um, as well as as mentioned, your gateways, uh, you also register with the Things Network. So the Things Network website allows you to handle your own gateways, applications, and devices, and as well as users as well. Uh, why are we doing this? Um, or why, why have uh, this sort of networks in place? Um, they, they're having um, sensors out in the environment um, is something that's um, is useful to people, uh, and it's um, 
becoming more and more ubiquitous, um, and we'll see in a bit um, how ubiquitous and how um, it's already out there, and, and we should be able to start using it. Um, and the more people that get involved and the more uh, the more that this stuff um, gets deployed, the, the more useful it's going to be for everyone involved. Um, so what sort of applications are there? Uh, this is in a local playground um, up here at, in Adelaide, another council, um, tea, tree, tea Tree Gully. Um, and it's a, a bin. Um, and it's got solar power on the top. It crushes the rubbish as you put it in. We, um, and it's got a sensor that will report when it's full um, so that the council workers don't have to know when they, they get there, they've got something to empty. It also means that um, it, it only gets emptied when it needs to be emptied. Um, so the, 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 sort of, the sort of community council services that you might see um, with, with these applications are things like barbecues, um, is the barbecue like working, um, traffic management, cars traveling on roads, uh, as mentioned with the bin, bus and waste management, also parking sensors for vehicles. Uh, we're talking about environmental sensors, um, air quality, temperature, humidity, um, environmental noise, soil mo moisture in parks and gardens, watering, etc. Lights, um, you could use it to monitor broken lights um, and maybe even sort of radioactivity and um, pollutants. In terms of citizen science, um, there's been a bit of work or interest around the place in terms of nesting boxes, um, the use, um, bee hotels, you could monitor how, how popular they are or where the activity is. Um, commercial applications, um, we've got um, metering, so the network could be used from, to look at your water, electricity, gas metering, um, vending machines, um, health and safety. Um, we've got uh, things like um, panic buttons um, or um, uh, GPS units, um, uh, monitoring location. Uh, um, you can, um, for instance, have, a, and I'll show a picture later of a, of a fob that does GPS. Um, so you might need, might want to asset manage your assets uh, and monitor that way. And then personal, um, I've tacked the one on the end because um, one of the one of the ways this with in which this technology is going to come out um, is so, with Amazon. They have something called Sidewalk, which is going to be included in their. Um, it was launched last year. Is going to be included in their um, home management stuff. Um, they will include. They're looking at including LoRaWAN connectivity and the what the the application that they're particularly pushing is pet monitoring so you can tell where your pet is and, and keep track of animals um, I don't know if it extends to doorbells but that's not something to um, to look out for okay uh, what's been used in the past um, we've got like I was saying with the with our um, case of the Art installation, we used a Wi-Fi network um, to pull the data in. Um, in, in industry, they use, they've used radio networks with SCADA um, and also direct radio links. I just, the, the difference between those two that I've considered there is radio network uh, would be a hub and spoke and a direct radio link um, would just be a point to link, some point to point link. Sometimes around the place, uh, you'll see a, a small Yagi antenna attached to a pole, attached to a green box. Uh, which would be a directed radio link back for some form of data control and, and collection. And then there's always the SIM cards um, and, and mobile phones, the mobile phone network. Um, but that can get expensive if you want to roll out a whole bunch of stuff and you've just got to register them somehow. Um, if you're looking at this sort of network, uh, what sort of things to consider? Um, when I first wrote this, um, I only had four when I first wrote this, um, but saying there are a large number of possible solutions that we could have considered. Um, low power, wide area networks 
uh, have been around for a while. And if you have a look at the Wikipedia page for the Dash 7 protocol, that actually gives a good list um, of and compare comparison between the ones that, ones that are available, um, including LoRaWAN. Um, so we one thing that we thing that we're not interested in is commercial vendor lock in. Um, uh, we want this to be as useful to as many people as we can. Um, cost effective, it needs to be um, do what it says and get value for money. Um, councils are spending our money, the um, ratepayers, so it needs to be useful. Um, and I added robustness after some other talks that I heard here at conference because um, what we were looking at for is something that will continue to work uh, and Laura Wan um, actually meets that requirement quite well in an interesting way. And finally, um, organisational culture with the with the council. Um, I was very happy to to hear some of the talks with the GoGlam MiniConf um, because we're all sort of on the same page. Um, councils love to be able to put um, things in place that benefit everyone. Um, spend the money wisely and, and help everyone. And Laura Wan technology actually can do that in quite an interesting way um, compared to your wireless networks and your um, 3G and, and phone, etc. Some of the groups that were involved in this program, um, the STEM programs with, with the Port Adelaide Enfield Libraries. Um, so I was involved there as a volunteer um, when this all happened. Um, Airstream Wireless is a large community wireless network uh, in Adelaide, uh, and, they, and we partnered with them to help put up some of the, put up and manage some of the access points that were deployed. Um, the Growing Data Foundation was another organization. They sponsor, sorry, they sponsor the Things Network here in Adelaide, uh, the user group, and also Hackerspace Adelaide who are full of useful um, people to know when it comes to doing electronics. So there was, all right, I'm going to talk about the global network. So what is LoRaWAN? And here's a, a bit of a diagram. So the, the end nodes, the things you put out, out into the environment are on the left. You have a set of um, gateways that listen to the radio transmissions, the, the LoRa radios um, in the middle in the middle there, and then they connect to the internet, um, either again by 3G or by hardwired. Typically, they'll be hardwired in, um, and they get the, the packets then go through a network server that can end up at the application server. So in the definitions of the, that I was talking about earlier, the Things Network is an application server. Um, but other companies can register their own. So, for instance, Schneider Electric have a regist are registered service prov registered provider for some some corporate type thing. Um, but the Things Network is the one that um, allows people to register their devices and their their gateways as community members, and then start using the network straight away. Um, and if so, with LoRaWAN, when people deploy a gateway. Uh, they're actually allowing other people to use it. So it's not, the gateways aren't tied to particular um, applications or particular um, users or the person that deployed the gateway. Those gateways will listen to anybody's LoRaWAN device and whichever one they, whenever they hear a, a packet from a LoRaWAN device, they'll forward that on to the network and eventually the application server. And you'll see that in the diagram, the um, the payload, that, the data that gets shipped, is secured by AES, and I'll sort of that'll come up briefly in a sec. Um, and then the backbones themselves between the gateways and the network servers are transmitted by S with an SSL encryption as well. So there's sort of a, a double layer of encryption, but the um, it's end to end from the node to the application server. Um, when you want to connect a device to the Things Network, um, there's a couple of things you need to know. And typically, they're the device ID and the application ID. So the application ID is your particular application that you're using to collect the data. And the device ID will be an ID either written on the outside of the box 
of, of the device if you purchase one uh, or something that you need to program in. Um, to get the your particular sensor onto the network, you can do it in two ways. Um, there's the first activation by personalization, which is essentially putting the specific um, encoding keys onto your device. Um, and that's only one directional. So that means that the device can transmit data back to the network, but it won't receive um, back channel data from the network to the node. So you'd be using that if you just wanted to have devices transmitting and then being picked up. And all the, and it would, it's in that mode, you can actually save power because all the device does is transmit a packet and then, and then stop. Um, it's not as um, secure or it's not as um, easy to secure, I should say, um, if the device gets rebooted for whatever reason, um, it will um, certainly when we, the ones that we built, um, and it's not keeping track of packet numbers, um, you can suffer from replay attacks in that mode. Uh, the other particular uh, mode is this over the air authentication requiring bi-directional communication. Um, so the gateways can transmit back to the um, devices. In that case, you need the device ID, an application ID, and then a, a shared secret between your device and the application called the application key. Um, and with those three bits of information, um, you can get your device onto the network. Um, in terms of the radio itself, um, this is what's used in Australia, the, this Australian uh, 915 megahertz. Um, and the, the devices will transmit on a particular, a packet on a particular um, frequency band as indicated there, and there's a whole bunch of them. Um, and then they will listen. So the green, they can transmit on the blue or the green. Uh, the blue are sort of wider bandwidth, which give you a, a longer range. Um, and the gateways will listen to all of that. And then once they've heard a packet, there's an the opportunity for data to be transmitted back to the device, which happens on the with the yellow frequency bands, and the devices need to listen to those for that data to come back. Um, and that waterfall in the top right is the sped spread, the, sorry, the chirp spread spectrum um, signal of a LoRa device. So that's not specifically a LoRa WAN. Um, that's just a LoRa signal as seen in a waterfall if you were to record the frequency spectrum um, for those that are interested. Okay, so now if we're looking at the, that, that's, that happens globally. So that th this frequency was specifically for Australia, but there's a the similar plans by different using different countries all around the world. Um, how do we make use of that um, in the local area? Um, so this is a map. Uh, excellent. Um, and I'm going to actually uh, tempt the demo gods, and we're going to go to a live version of this. So I'm going to stop that uh, and share again. Um, and I've, someone's, they've kindly forwarded to me three locations of people. Um, so we've got um, Altona and Victoria. So we might just zoom over. So, zoom over. So this particular tool here is the Things Network. Sorry, the Things Network Mapper. Shepard. And if we go to, I'm not exactly sure what Altona is. Maybe someone can tell me. Um, but if you're looking in Melbourne, there's, there's for instance, all the um, particular access points in Melbourne. And if you click on one, uh, it'll tell you. So, there's, so people have set these one up, set these gateways up, registered them with um, the Things Network, uh, and they appear on the map. Um, you might quite um, sometimes people uh, put the so Mesh is a particular company that's doing this. Um, and I'm trying to think where the no, that's another council one. Anyway, no. 
um, so that's, and then sort of the coverage of Melbourne. So in the CBD, um, it shows some of the coverage of where you should be able to, where these um, gateways will pick up a signal. Um, so the Melbourne, we've got... Uh, We'll have a look, quick look at Brisbane. Fly past Sydney. Let's see what we got. So th these are some locations that people said they were coming in from. Um, uh, not sure what's going on. Come on, Brisbane. I'm sure then I'm sure there's some IoT gateways there, some LoRaWAN gateways there somewhere. Oh, there we go. All right. And so there's a bit of a coverage there. Uh, yep. Yeah, so another so QUT. Um, we'll see Mesh come up again because that's they quite a. Um, they they have their own solution, um, which they provide to people, and that's one of the providers that got picked out for the. Port Adelaide, we'll put Adelaide Info Council to at one stage. Okay. Um, I'll fly back to Adelaide. So if you're if you've got um, if you would like to find out what your coverage is, you can use the, the TTN map to um, see what uh, what gateways are around and what you can see. What I wanted to point out um, was, so the Tea Tree Gully Council, which had that bin, um, have actually been quite proactive in the gateways that they de they've deployed. So all these um, gateways in here from the Tea Tree Gully Council, um, that's the Civic Centre. Um, for instance, um, in the Hope Valley. Um, and then the in our particular area, this is the, the gateway we've got set up. So this is this is once within the library itself um, at Enfield, and then we've got one down this end. Again, this is and this was done by Meshed for Port Adelaide Enfield. Okay, um, so yeah, no, it's a good. It, this is a useful tool um, to go in and have a look and I'll talk about how some of this stuff is also mapped. So the Things Network web page itself also has a um, map, but it doesn't show coverage. So um, uh, and so here, here uh, was a picture I took earlier um, of the coverage around sort of the, the Adelaide, Northern Adelaide area. Um, the way this particular map works is if you have a, the, a, a node connected with the things network, when it gets detected, um, when, it, when it sends out a packet that gets detected by the network, the network actually also reports signal strength. Um, and so the thing, what you can do is um, install the things the Things Mapper mobile app on your phone um, while you've got the, the, the particular node or, de, or LoRaWAN device um, with you. And it uses both of those bits of information from the mobile app and what was recorded by the Things Network to record the, the signal strength location. And eventually you end up, so you just wander around with this thing, receiving, sending and receiving packets, um, and it builds up the map. So it's well worth um, having a look at uh, the website, and if you're interested in in seeing where your particular, because it has a map where your particular device is getting picked up, um, it'll show you which gateways can see your device. Um, so moving on, um, the commercial solutions um, out there, there there are a few, um, and the, uh, this one was uh, so with the. There was a smart cities um, project. Several councils in Adelaide got together and decided they wanted to investigate this technology. And they had a contract with um, 
uh, meshed, um, who have their, they provide everything. They're sort of a whole, complete turnkey solution. Um, and there's another, uh, so the smart, smart city set up uh, a separate um, account with the things network. So in this case, we had two um, providers of this network. One, one did um, the LoRa gateways um, and provided some additional sensors as well. So there's parking sensors and the other one provided some bin, bin sensors. And they end up going through a, a set of servers. Um, so very similar to the way that the um, the conference band the conference badge works. The data ends up in, in an MQTT server provided by the Things Network. Um, you can you pull the data from that into some sort of um, uh, database. In which case they were using. Um, uh, what do they got there? This uh, they're using Postgres, um, and then pulling it into Grafana, which allows you to, to plot the data and see trends, etc. Um, that's certainly doable. And these guys, these particular organisations and companies, have their have set up their own um, scripts and things to do this, but it's not particularly open. Um, if we want to add another device using um, the meshed account, for instance, they will charge us. Um, if we want to experiment with, with something, uh, we get a we get a bill. Um, if we want to put a sensor somewhere that hasn't got any coverage via the LoRa gateway that's in the area, maybe a bit far. We, um, for instance, with with some new bins, um, they they would charge us to put a new gateway in to cover that area if if we were wanting to get them to do the service. I mean, fair enough, uh, but it's not particularly flexible and easy to, to do. And um, how do we how do we use this to um, um, improve um, and allow people to use this technology? Um, this was an example of the gateways that were put in and used. Um, at, at this stage, there wasn't the um, there wasn't the gateway at Enfield, um, but you can see that we had some down on the coast. We had two two there down at the Enfield Civic Centre, um, sort of in various directions. Um, the Parks Library, Green Acres Library, and then um, a Valley View as well with a sorry community centre there. Um, these, um, so these were, and these were put in by meshed. Um, what's the alternative? Oh, we, we dreamt something up. Um, we've got a Raspberry Pi that's running um, uh, Node Red, InfluxDB, and Grafana. So all, all the services are running on a single Raspberry Pi, which talks to the Things Network via MQTT. Um, and then in addition to that, the, the other pieces, the software that proved quite useful is something called Zero Tier, which is a virtual VPN um, freely available, um, which allows, allows you to connect and view the, the web page on that particular Raspberry Pi um, if you're on the same network. And that's been, that's been particularly useful for getting in, getting um, connecting up just uh, devices and um, that are, might be behind firewalls and, and uh, masquerading interfaces, etc. Um, and then we can connect whatever devices we want um, to the Things Network, and they just get picked up by the Node Red. Um, so, what sort of sensors were we looking at? Um, these were three that were purchased, um, which we could just add. Uh, when you when you this particular company Dragino, Dragino when they make it, um, you can um, uh, that you get the um, the the device ID um, 
put that into the Things Network. Um, they also include a application ID. So the application in, in the Things Network that you're using that gets mapped to an MQ, the MQ, MQTT channels, um, they pre-register the device and it comes with the device. So to get to, to put the device on, you just need the device ID and you re register a new application ID and away you go. Um, these, these things actually have a battery in them and are designed to last with that battery up for up to 10 years. So they're quite long lived. Um, other than the, the GPS um, location at the end, that would that needs sort of daily recharging. Um, these other two devices um, are just designed to sit there and transmit periodically. Um, this distance measuring sensor um, is something fairly that they make that's fairly standard. It's very generic. You can open it up and you can replace that sensor with something else um, uh, that has more than one channel in there, temperatures, humidity, etc. And you can they use that one model with, with a whole bunch of different sensors. Uh, and you can reflash the firmware and, and just use it for other things as well, which is good to know. Uh, okay. Sorry, I just lost my place. Moving on, um, this here was what we came up with for for our for the internal STEM program uh, in terms of what we used. It's an Arduino shield that has the LoRaWAN um, radio there in the middle. Um, uh, you can see um, some of the things that the sort of the way it connects up, and reasonably cheap. Um, at $40 uh, for an IoT shop. Um, that particular board in the middle, radio board, you can use yourself. It's only worth a couple of dollars. Um, but this came complete, and you could plug it onto Arduino and be off and running reasonably quickly. Uh, I say reasonably quickly because the particular um, library that we use with it um, is sort of being forked and forked again. And then finally, someone went and, and set it up for the Australian band. Uh, but it works quite e quite easily once once you've sorted out that the issue. So if you've got any questions about using this one, uh, more than happy to answer them. Um, we ended up using these um, in our workshop. Uh, we ran two two sets of workshops um, for for people in the library um, on how to connect it to the, running through how to connect it to the LoRaWAN network, and then collect data from it and end up graphing it. So um, this were the particular sensors that setups that we used. So the picture on the left is a moisture sensor um, just powered by a, a USB battery um, and then transmitting the data to LoR to by the LoRaWAN um, shield. And the one on the right um, had a couple of temperature and humidity sensors um, uh, which which the Arduino collected and then tra and transmitted with packets. Um, the once you've got the data into Laura in, via LoRaWAN and the Things Network, you can just pull it out uh, via MQTT messages. Um, the node on the top left there is the uh, Node Red MQTT client. It subscribes to a particular um, to a particular topic uh, in MQTT, and the the data just simply flows through that particular setting there. So you can see that in the pink pinkish um, nodes in the middle there, um, those Dragino first the top two are for the ones we purchased. Uh, the decrypt I/O sensor one was is the temperature sensor. Um, you can you pull out the code into J, you pull out the data into a JSON format, uh, and then format it up, and then it gets pushed into um, an influx DB database at the bottom bottom right. So at the end of the day, um, the data just, this this tool just allows you to pull the data in, decode it, and then push it into your time series database, and that's the result. So this was taken the week last week uh, after running it for a little bit. And you can just see the 
the temperature and and the humidity values of the two sensors that are on that particular um, device. Um, what next? Um, like I say, we ran the the two sets of workshops. Um, actually, if you're interested in um, follow, you can follow that link there. Um, that gives a full re rendition of the, of the four workshops in each series and, and how and what's involved in in pulling everything to get pulling everything together to make those devices work. Um, we delivered those two workshops and had quite a few people quite a few people interested. Um, and where do we go from here? Um, so this, and some may have seen this from maybe um, uh, Jonathan Oxer, maybe, but it's uh, the air quality sensor. And here I've just, I'm just accessing it via serial. Um, so this is sort of what we're up to uh, in terms of progress. Um, and then I'm going to look at what we're going to, how we're going to get this um, into uh, Laura, into the uh, LoRaWAN network. But as you see, sort of the data there, every um, 10 seconds, it transmits a packet of 32 bit bytes of data. Uh, and if you decode that, it's got the, the various particle sizes that this device detects. Um, so it actually, there's a little fan in it that samples the air um, with a laser and will report um, what the what the air quality or what particles are available in the in the laser. Um, these are some of the boards that we're looking at combining with it. Um, or I'll talk about the top one in a moment. But the the Helic automation one um, is a nice cheap little board um, with it with the display in it. Um, so you could use that to display the as well as sending it over LoRa. You could also use it to display the air quality in real time. Um, but the one at the bottom, this uh, TT Go T beam uh, with the ESP32 has a, a battery in the back. Um, so, for instance, we could hook up a solar panel uh, with the battery and put it out in the environment um, with the air quality sensor. It has a GPS location, so we could make a bunch of these um, and then they could report um, where they are and what their air quality is uh, maybe once an hour or so. Um, and that's that's kind of where we want to get to. Well, want to get to next is to is actually develop some of these sensors in addition to the ones that you can just buy. Um, um, so very quickly, um, just some other pro projects that are related. That that top board um, shown here is actually from the um, the Fossasat um, project. Um, it uses a similar, it's not using LoRaWAN, but it's using a similar um, a, a similar uh, idea um, to be able to talk to a satellite. So these are low Earth orbit satellites. They're going to be quite small that they're just working on at the moment, um, which will fly over twice a day. Um, and it could be useful to pick up data from sensors and then transmit them back down. So the, the LoRa radios in this case would end up going up to the satellite and coming back down again. Uh, and these particular boards are being used as their ground station boards as you see them there with power. Um, and then something just similar technology um, with regards to using MQTT messaging, Node, Node Red and MicroPython uh, are in things like the Swag Badge, Tasmota, um, Jonathan Oxer mentions it, Superhouse TV, um, and then others bit of tongue in cheek, but I'm looking at um, implementing some of this sort of stuff at, at home as well in the Super Chook House. Um, finally, um, some other things to, to think about. Um, uh, what are the legalities? So the radio spectrum itself, um, while it's um, ISM uh, and so not, it's type license, you don't need to, need to um, get a license specifically, it's included in the radio. Um, there are considerations about how many and how much data you can send. Um, uh, you don't want to be flooding the, the network um, if you can't, can help it because it's a, a um, common good, a, a um, commons. Um, 
and then there's also things like what what can you monitor or what what where do we consider monitoring in public spaces etc um and if you're putting out all these sensors what's the community acceptance the community benefits going to be um uh what what how else what can we do that's new here um if we're collecting this data and i, I say i put down monetizing data collection um can we do useful things with it that will um make them make make this data um uh like worth something um and then as part of that what do we do if we've got these sensors out there how do we look after them and how do we recycle them at the end of their at the end of their life so there's all sorts of things that need to be considered if we're going to deploy a whole bunch of these things um so i'd be more than happy to to hear if anyone's got any comments about that uh finally um um there's a this is non-sponsored plug the things conference is actually happening um starts tonight so if you're a a student you can get um with a university email account you can get free access um the the talk start at mid from midnight our conference time tonight because it's based in europe um and they go through some of this stuff in the first couple of talks as well. So if you're happy, if you if you're up then, I want to follow up on this, some of this th these things from um, engineers and people that um, deal with this stuff all the time. Um, then you can log into there, register and log into there. And then finally, uh, thanks to Robert Hart for taking me on as a volunteer um, and helping us with these STEM programs. Um, it's been a a great experience pulling all this stuff together uh, and while COVID hasn't helped um, it's kept my mind off other things so um, thank you again to the Port Adelaide Food Libraries for that and with that um, I'll ask for questions thank you very much that was an absolutely amazing presentation very very thorough um, I loved the map that was really great. It worked really well. Yeah, it was, great. Good? it was great to see Melbourne on screen. <laughs> um, uh, just um, there's been a lot of, of chat on the on the venulous side. I just have a quick question that I wanted to ask. Um, what can you see as would be the main driver to really bring this bring this sort of forward more? Do you see more sort of local government buy-in or? more industry buy-in or a collaboration in that way? Um, what the benefit, and this is the fit that with, with I think with um, councils and libraries, is that the when you put a gateway in, um, not only can, for instance, for a council, not only can the council use it for their council applications like bin monitoring, um, traffic monitoring, etc., but anyone that is in that area um, can use it for their own sensors and things as well. Um, the the new lot, the recently the the sensors that come out also have power management sort of built in as well. So the sensors will um, do, uh, use less power and hence give themselves more life if they if they notice that they're being um, received well. Um, so if you, the, so the more gateways that get put in, the better the whole network will work. Because the because um, your sensors can be a lower powered, uh, so you, and your your nodes. Um, and that that goes in nicely to our next question coming from the audience. Yep. What advice would you give for those wanting to contribute a gateway? Um, just put it in. Um, make sure you've you've got one that does uh, multiple channels. There are there are cheap ones around that are single channel only. They sense, for instance, they would use the that Arduino shield, but in a gateway gateway configuration. Um, uh, but they're not really that useful. You want one that does the entire uh, multi-channel. Um, uh, we'll look at the, the multi-channel um, spectrum. Um, and yeah, essentially, just if if there's none in your area, put one in. If you can, I mean. It can maybe maybe there's an opportunity for councils to do a um, uh, 
like a sponsor. We will we'll match you your funding to if you put one in because it will it will help the community. It's making use of the spectrum in a community um, orientated way that helps benefits everyone. Yeah. Um, so this is this is kind of what worries me a little bit about what Amazon are planning with their sidewalk. Um, hopefully they'll do it in a way that helps everyone. Um, but if you, I guess, if you buy a an Amazon Home um, assistant at some stage, it will include this. Now, whether that helps everybody is yet to be seen. Okay. That's fantastic. So that brings us to the end of the presentation. Just a reminder that you can continue the discussion with Paul on the Rusty R Hall post talk Q&A channel. Um, we're about to take an afternoon tea break, so enjoy. We're back here at 3.45 with Sunshine Meiti presenting What's Up Next for Bluetooth in Pulse Audio. Thanks again, Paul. Bye. Thank you.